I never understood how a country where one in every three people still use a fax machine also has the fastest trains in the world. A country where you literally bow to your superiors uses cartoon advertisements for their military. Japan is so different from anywhere else in the world, its culture feels like an enigma, a mystery that we hope to unravel. So we wanted to find out, what's Japan actually like? How different are the people and their culture? And is it really worth spending two weeks of our vacation here? For the past six months, we've been learning all we can about Japan. So join us as we immerse ourselves in the modern, the traditional, and everything in between to see what we can learn from the land of the rising sun. We kicked things off in Tokyo, where we went to a unique athletic event to begin our education on Japanese culture. First thing we wanted to do is to see a sumo match. But this wasn't just any ordinary sumo match. We would actually bear witness to a sumo retirement ceremony for a rare foreign-born sumo wrestler from the Republic of Georgia. This guy, the Royal Georgian. This is Ryo Goku National Sumo Arena. So, it's gonna be pretty interesting. Trevor, we're not gonna know sh <laughs> But we didn't need to read Japanese to see how different this experience was from sports in the US. Even sitting in our seats was different. Take your shoes off. You sit on these pillows. Here are the sumo wrestlers. And it wasn't long until I got overexcited. I'm gonna try and get close to the stage here. It was awesome to see these massive athletes up close and the fans excited to get pictures with their favorite sumo. I explored the stadium and wanted to see what concession stands looked like in a sumo arena. Here we got the sumo memorabilia. With all the different wrestlers. I made sure not to come back to Mary empty handed and was just in time for a special sumo retirement ceremony. Dignitaries took their turn cutting the Royal Georgian's Chunmaga hairstyle to signify his transition out of sumo. The cutting of the Chunmaga actually has an interesting backstory, but to show you, we had to brave the rush hour Tokyo commute to a place where Japanese history changed forever. I'm barely in. <laughs> Almost got chopped in half by the door. Good news, the platform's on the other side, which means we have to get through all these people. Look at these perfect lines people are forming to go down. This is a real society. <laughs> <laughs> such a cool jingle. I think that every station in Tokyo has its own jingle. We arrived in Tokyo Station's crowded but surprisingly civil atmosphere, excited to visit a nearby home with interesting significance. We're here in front of Tokyo's Imperial Palace, and it was right here on November 26, 1868, that two of the most important men in Japanese history passed by each other. And it would have enormous consequences for Tokyo and all of Japan. On his way out, was the Tokugawa Shogun, the last in the line of shoguns who ruled over all of Japan. And with his departure came the end of the Edo period, a time when Japan was closed off from the rest of the world and a lot of Japanese traditional arts were being cultivated and reinvented. On his way in was the young emperor Meiji, who wanted to move the society past its traditional ways into the future by embracing technology and the modern world. And both of these men's influences can still be felt in Japan today, where you see a dualism between tradition and embracing the future. To truly see the real Japan, we wanted to learn about its context as we traveled the country so we could understand what our eyes were telling us. Even the first thing we did in Japan couldn't escape this history. When the Royal Georgian's Chunmaga hairstyle was cut off, the sumo community was removing a hairstyle that was required of samurai by the Tokugawas during the Edo period, and then later banned by Emperor Meiji for everyone but sumo wrestlers and kabuki theater actors. So even today, when you become a sumo, you follow the Tokugawa's lead, and when you retire, you follow Meiji's orders and cut your hair. After the Imperial Palace, 
we headed to northwestern Tokyo, where we truly felt that we were in the middle of the most populated city in the world. <laughs> Shibuya Crossing is a five-way intersection that sees about 2,500 people per crossing. But if you closed your eyes, you would have no idea. I could hear Mary giggling under her breath and the advertisements talking despite the sea of people. With everything lit up and animated, I felt like I was in Blade Runner. Even the ramen spot felt futuristic. All right, Ready? English. English. America. After dinner, we stopped in Shinjuku to see if we could find the infamous piss alley. You ready to see some piss? Oh, follow your nose. I think we found it. Here is the beginning of the piss alleys. One. And where there's piss, there's an American style pop. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I smelled something. Yeah. Mm, feels like home. <laughs> Officially named Shinjuku Golden Guy, the alleys made us feel like we traveled back to old Tokyo. I feel like each bar can fit like five, six people in yeah. it probably. Honestly, I feel like if you stay at the same bar, there's probably a real vibe that gets going. Yeah. Damn, this place is cool. I'm hearing a lot of Australian accents here oh, today. Oh, yeah. I think you come <laughs> to get wicked pissa here. Yeah, I think. If that's not Australia, then it's not. It's Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right, yeah. You might even make some friends from around the world. The next morning, we set out to Tokyo's famous fish market, and even the journey there had some fun surprises for us. Because they drive on the left-hand side, so even when you're walking, you can see the arrows going that way, and these going this way. This is a barefoot station, almost like those outdoor gyms we've seen in, in the US, but for walking barefoot through all the levels of pain. <laughs> One of the reasons we were initially hesitant to book a vacation to Japan was because it seemed so culturally foreign to us. And I think we were scared to leave our comfort zone. For Mary, that hesitancy extended to Japanese cuisine, which we would put through a series of tests at the fish market. I got the Mary doesn't really like matcha, but. But that is very subtle, and I do like that. Mary came in for seconds. She generally doesn't like matcha at all. I hate it, but this is actually good. <laughs> So we just got these little omelet cubes. They have egg. Dashi. Dashi. Okay. Fish. Mary's gonna try some. <laughs> Whoa. Honestly, it tastes like the outside edge of French toast. If you put egg and maple syrup a little bit and a little bit of like fishiness, pretty good. Even though that description does not sound good. On our way to the third and ultimate test, we saw a beautiful knife shop and some Japanese home goods stores. But the fishmongers were craftsmen in their own right, continuing a tradition that stretches back to the first Tokugawa shogun. In 1603, Tokugawa Ieyasu started his shogunate by moving the seat of political power from Kyoto to Edo, a town that started as a fishing village and today stands as Tokyo. Ieyasu recruited the best fishermen in Japan to move from Osaka to Edo to supply Edo Castle with fresh fish. Today, Edo Castle has become the Imperial Palace, but the skilled fishermen remain. So for our final test, we tasted what the Tsukiji fish market is known for, and Mary was hesitant to eat, raw tuna. Oh my god. That is very, very good. And buttery. Do you like it, genuinely? <laughs> We're gonna stop at 7-Eleven, because Mary- I gotta rinse the fish taste out of my mouth with some milk tea. <laughs> For those of you who haven't heard, 7-Elevens in Japan are something to experience. They have tons of delicious Japanese snacks and even prepared food that's quite tasty. We ate our weight in 7-Eleven onigiri on this trip and had no regrets. Convenience stores like 7-Eleven are called konbinis in Japan, and they even have food technology we never saw before. There's a case which looks like it would be a cold case back home, but the beverages are hot, so you have little coffee lattes. This is like a more floral version of a sweetened milk tea. These hot cases are everywhere, in metro stations and even vending machines. Still got the fish taste? We were going to get a special Japanese on-the-go meal, when we realized the Japanese were living even farther in the future than we could imagine. I don't know if you can see it right now, but that guy's peeling a hard boiled egg on his little scooter, <laughs> waiting for the light. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh, he's eating he it. Eggman. 
Dude, that is unreal. Eggman rises. What a legend. Scared to follow Eggman's lead, we settled for Japanese curry bread back in Shibuya. But instead of 2,500 people crossing the street, this area was very quiet and full of high-end boutiques. But we could get global brands anywhere. Instead, on our last night in Tokyo, we found a design district on the other side of the city, featuring craftsmen who keep Japanese history alive through their work. We came to find a piece of clothing I haven't owned in decades, and along the way found plenty of other interesting artisans. There was a custom umbrella store. Wow, so he makes the umbrellas for you on the spot. A wooden container store. A furniture maker. A woman's clothing store. Natural dyes? Yeah, all natural. All in Japan? All made in Japan. Oh, that's beautiful. And a home decor store where you can buy some beautiful gifts. But what caught my curiosity was Blue Trick, a Japanese denim boutique. Each denim piece was made from Japanese cotton and dyed with Japanese indigo. It was the perfect place for me to bring jeans back into my wardrobe after a 15 year hiatus. Even Mary joined in on the fun and got some jeans with the biggest pocket the world has ever seen. Hi. Arigatou gozaimasu. Tokyo surprised us. It was clean, orderly, and on our last night, it started to snow. Just woke up and some of the clothes from the washer slash dryer are not completely dry. So I'm gonna go out and I need to get 100 yen coin to use the dryer downstairs. There is a vending machine here. I wonder if that'll give me change because they got the warm vending machine stuff. Might be worth it. What do we got? We got coffee, coffee. We got like corn potage. That is, that, I might have to buy that. I'm gonna buy the corn. <laughs> Thousand yen bill in here. Am I sure I want the corn? Look at this, it's even got corn texture. What the hell is this? This place never ceases to amaze me. I've returned with a bountiful harvest. Corn. Corn? <laughs> You've been corn. Hopefully it's not carbonated corn, or else we're gonna be in the <laughs> whole world of trouble. We packed up and said goodbye to our hotel, excited to take the train to our next destination. But before we could leave Tokyo, I needed to make a quick pilgrimage to my childhood. As a kid, I wasn't as influenced by Japanese culture as some are, but when I saw Akihabara's vintage electronics market, all the memories came rushing back. Wow, look at that. Look at the old Game Boys. Game Boy Color. Oh, here it is. Pokemon Gold version. When I was a kid, I made a friend uh, who was a hockey player named Blair, and his parents, as a gift, bought me Pokemon Gold version after I had played the original Pokemon Yellow. And I remember just being so obsessed with this game uh, and playing it in the train in Europe when we lived in Czech Republic. That's, uh, yeah, that was amazing. What a great game. I used to play Nintendo with my brother and I would be Princess Peach, but then I realized that my controller wasn't plugged in. <laughs> it went on for like three years. <laughs> There's an interesting history with PlayStation where Sony was developing CD-based gaming with Nintendo. They were just going to be supporting Nintendo to do this, and at the last minute, Nintendo pulled out, and uh, there was an employee at Sony who said, screw it, we should just make it our own game, and we should enter the video game business. And he worked really, really hard to convince the CEO of Sony to do it. Uh, and in the end, they did, and PlayStation was born. The rest is history, really. I mean, PlayStation, I think, is probably maybe the most successful um, video game console there is. Walking around Akihabara, we saw just how global Japan's reach has been for the past half a century. It's a far cry from the Edo period when foreigners who landed on shore without permission were executed. When Emperor Meiji replaced the Tokugawa shogunate, he radically changed Japanese society. Meiji industrialized the economy at a rapid pace, building factories and railroads, desperate to catch up to Western countries. Japanese society was also shaken up when Meiji abolished the samurai system that gave the shogunate its power and outlawed the dress and haircut worn by the mythical warriors. He also renamed Edo to Tokyo, which translates to Eastern Capital, and transformed Edo Castle into the Imperial Palace. But why? Why would a society do a full 180 and break with hundreds of years of tradition? 
To understand the spark that led to this historic shift, we would need to march back through time and our first stop would be the city Meiji left to come to Tokyo, Kyoto. Honey, how you feel about the trains? I am so excited. These things go like 300 miles an hour, you know that? Is it 300? I thought it was 200. Whoa, look, she's like turning the seats around. It's showtime. Oh. Are you ready for the snack down? We have the Kalbi potato sticks, new flavor unlocked cheese. Whoa, it looks wildly artificial. The cheese is a subtle flavor. Cheesy. We're starting to put the pedal to the metal here. Leaving every 30 minutes from Tokyo Station, the Shinkansen bullet train is a demonstration of what train travel should be. Rocketing through the countryside at 200 miles per hour, you feel completely at ease inside. Sleeping Beauty just got up in time for the lobster chips. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Subtle, early taste of lobster, tapers into just a crisp potato chip. Pretty good. This is milk tea flavored chocolate truffles. And in two hours, we arrived in a city very different from Tokyo. Welcome to Kyoto. Kyoto is Japan's historic capital, and walking through its Gion district, you feel like you've stepped right back into the Edo period. Kyoto has just one-tenth of Tokyo's population at 1.4 million people, but it's not just fewer people that make Kyoto feel different. Our first impressions of the city's architecture, especially in the Gion historic district, left us speechlessly wandering through its streets in awe. And that feeling even extended to the other side of the city when we saw the traditional home we would be staying in. We have slippers here awaiting us. Whoa. A little garden. That is so cool. Oh my goodness, this is a tiny but deep tub. I feel like one of my feet would fit on that. <laughs> I need to be careful of these things because I will not fit through. These are some steep stairs. All right. Wow, look at this, the tatami mats. Yeah. I think you can do a tatami mat if you want. Wow. Because there's like bedding in here. What's out here, Mary? Oh, well, we're going into Nijo Castle here in Kyoto. Nijo Castle is a very interesting place. It was built by the Tokugawa shogunate in the 1600s, right after they moved the political capital to Tokyo. But the emperor and the official capital was still here in Kyoto. So Tokugawa constructed this castle to have a nice place in the official capital and probably to show a little bit of force to the emperor next door that there's a new castle in town here. Goodness. Wow. Just wait till you see this gate. See the Japanese joinery here? The structure of the door is like held together through basically mathematics. You don't need a ton of nails. We're gonna check out the gardens here in the palace. buy carp food here for the moat carp. Oh wow, that's a lot of carp. Well, we just came out of Ninomaru Goten Palace, which is where the Shogun resided. And it's also the place where the Shogunate officially ended. The Tokugawa Shogun restored the political power of the emperor right in that palace. Unfortunately, we can't film in there, so you're gonna have to go check it out yourself. It's really worth it. it it's the most beautiful it. castle I've ever seen in my life. After the last Tokugawa Shogun resigned his title at Nijo Castle, the nation's eyes shifted a mile east, to the Kyoto Imperial Palace where 16-year-old Emperor Meiji was about to make history. 
so Mary and I walked over to see it for ourselves. The Emperor would have been here, hearing the news from the Tokugawa Shogunate. They were resigning their political power. Throughout most of Japanese medieval history, the Emperor was a symbolic figure, a living deity who was technically head of state, but had no real political power. Meiji's imperial lineage stretched back thousands of years, but not since the 12th century was the Emperor actually in charge of running the country. This palace was built in 794, when Emperor Kamu moved the capital from Nara to Kyoto. The palace has burned down several times uh, and been restored. And it's, it's really pretty. We've got the Tori Gate Orange here. Yeah. Right on the other side of this Jumeimon Gate is where the young Meiji laid out how he would rule in his five charter oath and ascended to the throne beginning the Meiji era and bringing Japan into the industrial era. But Japanese culture isn't just the result of two men, right? A lot of our culture comes back from the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and who we should be. And a lot of those stories can be traced back to religion. There are three religious philosophies that have strongly influenced Japanese culture. Luckily for us, they also make for some of the best sights to see in Kyoto. You purify your hands and your mouth before you go into the shrine. So now that we're all clean, shrine time. We're here in a Shinto shrine. I don't know the name of the shrine. We can do that part later. We're here at shrine. <laughs> this is Hayan Shrine. This is a Shinto shrine. And Shintoism has deep roots in Japan. It's a religion that believes in respecting nature, respecting your ancestors, in purifying yourself, body and mind. Also this idea that everything has a spirit. Plants, trees, people uh, all have their own unique spirit. And you can see how it affects Japanese culture in the art of gift giving. Gifts uh, are very important and when someone gives a gift, they're giving a piece of their spirit to someone else. So it's a very sacred process. How do you feel in the shrine? I really like it. It's a great example that uh, you can really only be your best if you accept help and you let the community hold you up. These sticks are the community. <laughs> to get one of these little fortune papers, you take this golden case, you shuffle it over, and then a stick will come out with a number on it. 29. That number you present to the person up there and they give you the corresponding little fortune. And what you do is you read it. If it's good luck, you want to attach it to a wire or a tree to make sure that it comes true. And if it's bad luck, you want to also attach it to a wire or a tree so it cancels out the bad luck. So we're going to see uh, what this one is and uh, we're going to attach it to a wire. I can guarantee that. If you listen to yourself properly and follow the path, you will receive help from others. Shinto shrines have some recurring characters, like the Kitsune, which are foxes that are messengers of the fertility god Inari. Tori gates. Each of these Tori gates has a sponsor, so the writing on them indicates who donated the Tori gate to the shrine. So you could have your business or whatever you want on a Tori gate as well. All you need is some money and a donation. I remember when I was a kid, I saw segment on the news about this really? and the visual of all of these gates has stuck in my mind since I was like eight years old so it's pretty cool to be here. Sake barrels. Found out yesterday this is not sake made at the temple but it's sake given to the temple by sake makers who uh, want good luck and want a good harvest for their sake. And Komainu guardians who protect entrances. What I like the most about Shinto shrines in Japan is how easily accessible they are. From extravagant shrines like Fushimi Inari with its 10,000 tori gates, to the tiny Nishiki Tenmagu shrine right in the middle of Kyoto's Shingyoku shopping street. It's easy to pop into a shrine, reset yourself spiritually, and then move along with your day. After the shrines, we needed to fuel up because the next morning we had to travel to the rural outskirts of Kyoto to see the second spiritual influence on Japanese culture. What we didn't know was that our evening beforehand would turn into a highlight on our trip. 
For dinner today, we got a reservation a week in advance, actually two weeks in advance maybe, to Tepan Tavern that apparently is really worth the reservation. Inside, we met Hideki and Naoko, the husband-wife team behind Tepan Tavern. Usually our gluten allergy makes dining experiences more difficult, but this time we were privy to dinner with one other couple at the beginning of Tepan's opening hours to ensure an allergen-free experience. So basically, we had dinner with Hideki and Naoko while they made it right in front of our eyes. We got a Japanese cheat sheet here to learn some Japanese. Oh, octopus is called tako? Tako. Takoyaki. Like... We ordered atsukan, aka hot sake, which we highly recommend for a smoother, sweeter taste. It also came with these cool cups. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that is beautiful. After we dusted off some delicious courses, Hideki told us about some of his ingredients. The wagyu beef steak is coming. Freshly oh. grated wasabi. I grade on this board. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gently. <laughs> With a smile. <laughs> I can taste the smile. Yes. <laughs> And this was be from around the Mount Fuji. Oh. Because wasabi needs very clean and pure water. Mm. Nah. Mm -hmm. Shark skin. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I caught. No. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Very good. Very good. This is such a highlight of the trip so far. It really is. Getting to watch you cook. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Mary came a long way since the fish market, even getting excited for bonito fish flakes. Oh, the bonito. And taco uh. <laughs> His name is taco <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> So cute. <laughs> We're actually going to be making an entire video on all of the amazing places we ate on this trip. So don't miss that if you want some food tips. We're gonna go out of Kyoto a little bit and see the famous bamboo forests. The forest path took us straight to the second spiritual influence on Japanese culture, Buddhism. When you walk out of the bamboo forest, there is a path here that has a bunch of temples on it, Buddhist temples. Buddhism was brought to Japan from China. The religions aren't as much like a competing religion where you believe one, you're either a Christian or a Muslim. People take influence from Shinto, Buddhism, from and all of these sort of different ways of thinking blend together and synthesize in the Japanese culture. These are the guys. So these sculptures here, they keep away evil spirits from the temple. Also, wow, abs. On that guy. <laughs> hey, 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 calm down, calm down. Buddhism talks about mindfulness and being in the moment. Another interesting component is the koan practice. And these are like stories or allegories that are sort of open-ended and they just make you think. The how Miyazaki movies as well, the endings are sort of, they seem random or maybe a little bit unfulfilled, but this is actually like something that's seeped into Japanese culture. This bathroom has slippers. Look at this. <laughs> you also see Zen Buddhism's influence through the teacher-student relationship that develops in Buddhist monasteries. And you can see that throughout Japanese society. When you're starting in your profession, you have a teacher, you listen to the teacher, you respect the teacher, you do the kata or the tasks that make you great, and eventually you will have mastered this to the point where you can be the one who is the teacher. Even a tea ceremony in Japan requires students to repeat simple movements for years before they can perform the ritual with a clear mind and the approval of their teacher. 
The third religious force, although it's a lot of times looked at as a philosophy here in Japan, is Confucianism. Confucianism has certain tenets that refer to maintaining a strict hierarchy, respect towards your parents and those older to you, and also keeping balance within society. The Japanese quest to preserve harmony among the entire society can actually be seen on every street. Bikes stand unlocked because theft just isn't part of the culture. There are yellow textured lines that help the blind navigate through their footsteps. And on rail platforms, you'll hear the sound of chirping birds played through speakers to alert them of a stairway. Historically, the hierarchical nature of Confucianism was more emphasized during the Edo period, placing the samurai ruling class comfortably at the top. You could even say they were too comfortable, especially with the Tokugawa shoguns closing off the country from any foreign influence. It turns out the Tokugawas and their isolationist ideas actually rose to power in response to a national embarrassment that destabilized Japan, and this chaos came to a head in the vibrant city of Osaka, which we were eager to explore in a couple days. On our way to Osaka, we stopped in the small city of Nara because we heard it was a must-see. We were sad to leave Kyoto, with its delicious food, historic districts, and even some modern art that made us think deeper about Japanese identity. We pledged to return to Kyoto one day and got ready to explore Nara. There's a giant line for this treat that I've been waiting for for over a year, but it will be worth it. This is so soft. Definitely come to Nakatanido and get the famous mugwort mochi. As delicious as the mochi was with red bean paste at the center, the real attraction was about to start. This is kind of crazy. <laughs> All right, everyone, we can calm down now. <laughs> In Japanese, do means the way, and it hints at something deeper. You might know words like dojo or judo, and the performance we just saw reminded us that the Japanese exalt their traditional methods. The Edo period saw the popularization of Bushido, the way of the warrior, which is still central to Japanese culture today. Bushido emphasized the samurai ways of bravery, martial arts mastery, and honor until death. And joined with Buddhist tenets of mastery through repetition, it makes for some incredible results from the boardroom to the mochi hall. That discipline seemed to stop at humans though, when we entered Nara's Deer Park. <laughs> We're all going. <laughs> this guy. Hey, bud. See, Trevor, this is what I was telling you. Their little fuzzy butts are so cute. Look at this. He doesn't even want the cracker anymore. He's done. He's like, nah. Get away from me. There's these crackers for the deer sort of just everywhere. Like, it's like bordering on the litter. Water. Deer park, you know, if you got kids, mm. come see the deer. But. I don't know. I don't I think it's that great. Just... But on the other side of the park, we saw something much more impressive. I feel like this is a little bit next level from what we've seen so far. I mean, just the gate is larger than some of the temples we've yeah, seen Yeah, the before. gate is absolutely massive. In the late 700s, Emperor Kamu, who is a ancestor of Emperor Meiji and the current emperor, moved his capital from Nara all the way to Kyoto. And he did so because the Buddhist monks who were in this temple, the Todaiji temple, were very powerful and were affecting political life. So he wanted to get away from them and to have more of a say in how things were conducted. Whoa. Now that is a temple guardian right there. Todaiji was built in 752, and it was one of the seven great temples of this part of Japan, which were the powerful Buddhist temples in this area. And you can tell. It was clear these spiritual forces shaped Japanese political life when we saw the temple's giant Buddha. Wow. No, not that one. This one. I just noticed the, the little Buddhas all around him. Yeah, isn't that so cool? Look at that, all the way up. What is this? If you can fit through the hole of this pillar, you'll have good luck. <laughs> Let's see if my boy can get through. Oh, I don't think so. But if an emperor escaped the powerful Buddhist monks in the 700s to ensure imperial rule, how did the Tokugawa shoguns end up running the country? And what led to their downfall? To find out, 
We hopped on a train to Osaka, riding in true Japanese style. Fate decided we were taking the Hello Kitty train to Osaka. Look at that little bell right there. Oh, that's cute. So cute. We didn't know it yet, but Osaka would show us a side of the Japanese we weren't expecting. <laughs> Here. This is nuts. It's also like not as quiet as Tokyo, which has a ton of people. Yeah. I just feel like more energy in the air here. Yeah, there's a lot. What is happening over there? <laughs> Taco son, all grown up. Taco did it big. <laughs> It's funny how we came to Tokyo and we're like, oh, this is what Japan is like. And so we went to Kyoto and we're like, oh, this is what the Japanese are like. Yeah. Now we're in Osaka and it's totally different. If you could distill Osaka down to a single person, it would be Shiho. She runs an entire four floor delicious restaurant by herself with creativity and energy. Osaka is known for two dishes, okonomiyaki, which we wolf down at Oko. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're amazing. How do you do how do you do this by yourself? Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Okini. And the second is Takoyaki. Octopus balls. Or balls of fried octopus. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've taken the subway out to the Hirano Ward to find Komeko, who runs Komeko Takoyaki, a tiny restaurant Komeko started so her friend with a wheat allergy could enjoy takoyaki, just like us. Mm-hmm. Fully satisfied, we visited Osaka Castle with cherry trees in bloom to learn the mystery of the Tokugawas. Before Emperor Meiji and the Tokugawa Shogunate, Japan was a land of disparate clans vying for power until this man behind me, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, unified all of Japan under his rule. And he later had a dream of conquering China and they launched an expedition through Korea trying to go into China, failed and were stopped with their Navy destroyed and not able to resupply, had to come back in shame without any plunder and a lot of deaths and that weakened the clans associated to Hideyoshi, which gave the influential samurai leader of Kanto a window of opportunity. I love how you're like, oh, that's cool, there's a fortification, and I was like, rooftop terrace. Can we go up there, please, please, please? <laughs> As the failure of Toyotomi's conquest of China became obvious, he succumbed to illness and died, triggering a power struggle that was finally resolved 17 years later when his son Hideyori faced Tokugawa Ieyasu on the battlefield, fighting to keep his dynasty alive under the castle his father had built. Tokugawa Ieyasu emerged victorious and made sure that during the Edo period, no embarrassing foreign intervention was ever attempted. The Tokugawa's Edo period used this inward focus to develop distinctly Japanese practices, but it also made the leadership stagnant and comfortable, insulated from the rest of the world. The problem was that one day, the world came to them. In 1854, Commodore Perry of the US Navy arrived with 10 warships whose presence forced Japanese representatives to open ports to United States merchants. This time, embarrassing failure came to the Tokugawas. And so it was up to new leadership to add another pillar to Japanese character. Because like with people, character is defined not only by our past, but also by who we choose to become. <laughs>